I'm Sarah Williamson, and this is Going Long with FCLT Global. On this show, you'll learn what it means to be long-term from the top minds in global business and investing. Leaders from companies and investment organizations join us to discuss how they are leading their teams for the long run on issues including capital allocation, risk management, climate change, and sustainability. To learn more, visit our website at fcltglobal.org. Our guest today is Chad Kat Lim, the CEO of GIC, Singapore's Sovereign Wealth Fund. He's been GIC CEO since 2017 and was the Group Chief Investment Officer since 2013. Chad Kat is also an active supporter and member of the Board of Directors of SCLT Global and has been involved in the beginning, for which we are very grateful. So welcome, Chad Kat. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Sarah. It's great to be here. Great. So for our listeners around the world who are less familiar with GIC, could you discuss the organization's origins and its purpose? Just tell people a little bit about um, who you are and and, and why you do the work you do. Right. Thank you. Uh, Let me actually start by just, you know, putting some words on uh, FCLT. Uh, I've been involved with FCLT Global's effort for quite some years now. Uh, The mission really resonates with, uh, you know, what, I think you know is the right way of uh, sort of wiring the capital markets. It certainly resonates with uh, GIC's way of doing things, uh, focusing on the long term. And I really enjoyed uh, working with and learning from uh, many of you know my esteemed uh, peers and, and colleagues. Uh, so it has been a great uh, privilege and opportunity to do this. Uh, now on to GIC. Uh, GIC was set up in 1981 uh, by the Singapore government. So in fact, this year is our 40th, uh, 40th year. We are celebrating our 40th anniversary this year. It's quite a milestone. Uh, it was set up uh, 40 years ago as our sovereign wealth fund, even though back then, uh, nobody really you know, would sort of look at a fund of this uh, nature as a sovereign wealth fund. Right, that term only came about uh, about 12, 13 years ago. Uh, the objective uh, was very clear, uh, which was to uh, you know, build a long-term value out of our reserves. Um, that's something uh, our founding fathers, uh, Lee Kuan Yew and Dr. Go King Sui, uh, recognized you know, that, that GIC should be set up you know, to do that job. Um, but one way to think about GIC is that we, we serve uh, three sort of functions. One, we are a rainy day fund right, for any contingencies uh, where financial resources are needed by the country. Uh, GIC plays a role in that. Uh, we are also a stability fund um, with the reserves which we manage. Uh, it helps to... Uh, make sure that you know the Singapore financial system uh, operates uh, well, and the third is as an endowment fund. Uh, I, you know, about 15, 16 years ago, uh, we changed our constit- we amended our constitution to allow the government to draw down part of the returns uh, from the reserves, which uh, are managed by GIC and our sister organizations, uh, the MASIC and uh, MAS in Singapore, uh, as part of the government spending. Uh, So GIC invests globally uh, outside of Singapore uh, in a diversified way across different asset classes for 40 years now. I think one of the things for those of us who spent a little time in Singapore that's so um, uh, inspirational is the, the long-term objectives that both Lee Kuan Yew and the founders of Singapore, but also the founders of GIC had, which is, and it is interesting in your 40th year to think that 40 years ago with a fairly small amount of money and, uh, and a fairly young country that, that there was the foresight to set this up. So how do you continue to um, have that long-term look forward as you, you know, as you end that and that sort of big um, aspiration of, uh, of being such a, a significant participant in the global capital markets. Right, uh, Sarah, as uh, you noted, right, that uh, 
we have this way of doing things. It, it sort of came from the history, right? Partly, as, as you said, uh, when GIC was set up, that was already the, uh, the thinking uh, that we would like to invest the money over a long period of time to generate long-term return. Uh, I would also say long-termism is a bit of a national ethos <laughs> that uh, I think the people here like to kind of think about, uh, you know, when we embark on an effort uh, that, you know, take a long-term mindset, uh, make it sustainable. And really the nature of this uh, funds which we manage, uh, ultimately, of course, uh, are for the benefits of Singaporean. Uh, and that means to think about it as an intergenerational fund. Right? Often we would hear that the pension funds are very long-term in nature because uh, the money is needed for retirement. Uh, needs of people. In the case of GIC, the funds are in a way of even longer nature because it goes beyond even the current generation. Um, so that, I guess, define uh, how we think about time horizon. Um, so that's, uh, you know, how, I guess, every day we, we try to abide by it. And could you give us some examples of how that comes into to play, either in terms of how you manage the organization or how you manage investing, where you've you know, perhaps been willing to make an investment in something that you knew wasn't going to pay off very soon, right. but that would pay off over um, a number of years? Right. Yeah, I, you know, maybe a few comments on this. One is uh, basically how does long-term kind of mindset gets into our uh, investing approach or our strategy. Um, I think it's important to emphasize that to do this well, you need the, the kind of whole ecosystem to function consistently. And that requires quite a few things, right? The starting point for any investor would be our investment philosophy. Uh, in the case of GIC, our philosophy is one that focuses on fundamental value of assets. So we do a lot of work to try and determine uh, what is the fundamental value of an asset that you know, we come across. Uh, and also we try to add value to that assets once we have acquired it, acquired it, right? So, so that is very much the philosophy, uh, which of course is uh, consistent with uh, having a long-term mindset. The second thing is really, uh, very importantly, the governance. Um, because we want to make sure that our work is, uh, our objective is aligned uh, with our stakeholders. Uh, so in the case of uh, GIC, the governance, uh, thankfully, our clients and our board of directors uh, of the same mindset. Right, that uh, when they look at the policies of GIC, when they look at the results of GIC, when they look at the activities of GIC, they wear the long-term hat. Uh, they look through the lens of, uh, of long-term. So governance is uh, important. Uh, the third would be, of course, the mandate itself, right? There is clarity of this emphasis on long-term outcome. Uh, our primary uh, performance measure, for example, is a rolling 20-year real rate of return measure. I think in the marketplace, you actually don't you know, see a lot of uh, that kind of performance measure. right? So in GIC's case, of course, we measure across different time horizon, but the 20-year rolling uh, return is what you know, gets the most attention. Uh, from the management, from our staff, from uh, our stakeholders. So mandate clarity is uh, the third thing that's important. The fourth is, of course, organizational practices, right? Some people would call this culture. Uh, so you have to do a lot of work, you know, you have to align uh, incentive, for example, you have to align your recruitment uh, policies 
uh, all your HR practices should be aligned to that uh, idea that you know we want people to sort of make decisions with the long-term mindset. And finally, communication. Uh, we have to take care in how we talk about our activities, our results, our strategies. Just as an example, I think in, in financial markets, sometimes we, we hear comments like, uh, long-term is but a series of short-term. Uh, that is something we, we, do not, uh, we do not agree with. And that's something we would not say in GIC because the drivers of uh, long-term outcome and the drivers of short-term outcomes are very different. Uh, so we take quite a lot of care in how we communicate internally and externally. We take a lot of care, for example, when we show performance of our portfolios, uh, even if we have multiple time period, we put particular emphasis on the longer term horizon ones, right? We might put them on the same page, but we might start with the 20 year or the 10 year rather than the you know, last quarter or last six months. So little things like that uh, actually are important because uh, there's always this temptation and this pressure uh, to want to go short term. Uh, so we have to be consciously uh, designing and, and practicing you know, long-term uh, in, in how we run the company. Uh, so with all these five things, I would say then the portfolio or the investment strategy almost quite naturally uh, would look at drivers or uh, value, right, which is long-term in nature. Uh, and we find, in fact, that does give us you know, quite a bit of advantage. Uh, having a long-term mindset translate to quite a, quite a few positive things. Uh, first, of course, is you can take advantage of compounding, right? For us or for, I think, a lot of long-term investors, uh, one of the success formulas is really to look for uh, quality assets which compound over a long period of time. Right? That doesn't require you to constantly be buying and selling to try and create return. Uh, of course, it's not easy to find these assets, but if you have this mindset, you're more able right, to get to uh, a, a kind of a smaller universe of that. So compounding uh, is, is, a, is an advantage. The second, of course, is it allows you to harvest risk premium. So as a long-term investor, we are able, for example, to allocate some part of our funds to illiquid assets, which tend to give you a little bit of uh, extra, right? And because you have the time horizon, you, you can harvest that. And that also is, of course, partly because not every investor can do that, right? So if you have that, uh, you're lucky to have that uh, time horizon, make use of it. And the third way is you can do what we call counter-cyclical rebalancing, right? Rebalancing, of course, is quite a standard kind of uh, asset allocation uh, practice, but really only a long-term investor can, can do that well, right? So that over time also give you uh, a little bit of extra return. Maybe the fourth way is uh, from time to time, you get these locations. Uh, either because investors are forced to buy or forced to sell because they have short-term pressures or short-term requirements, uh, then long-term investors actually are in the position, uh, you might say, to take advantage of those uh, dislocations. And finally, we find uh, having a long-term mindset is, is really helpful for building partnership um, because... I mean, to really build a uh, good partnership, it takes time. It takes, uh, frankly, sometimes give and take. And you can only do you know, these over a long period of time. So in GIC's case, for example, we have, had, we have some uh, relationships uh, which go back a long way, you know, like 30, 30, 30 odd years. Uh, you know, many of our actually business partners are very successful, very big, 
uh, very, you know, uh, uh, sort of yeah, really successful today. But when we started with them, they were very small. We were very small as well. Uh, but we grew together, right? And after 30 years, uh, even longer, I think we, we got really solid uh, relationship with many of them because we really have gone through, you know, the ups and downs. And time really can help uh, in building relationship. And, and GIC depends uh, a lot on our partners. Uh, so again, having these, you know, actually we have many really good relationships, uh, are quite a, quite a helpful uh, thing for GIC. So that's how we have, you know, kind of looked at uh, having a longer horizon has helped GIC to progress uh, over a long period of time. And certainly we have a lot of conviction that uh, it is a winning formula <laughs> that it will still continue to give us many of these benefits going forward. I think it's definitely a winning formula and listening to you talk about it, I think the other thing that's so interesting is how all the pieces fit together. I, I find sometimes people try to do one of the things that you mentioned, you know, they try to have long-term investments, but they don't have long-term governance or something like that. And then of course, um, it can't last. So I, I think that one of the lessons that we can all learn from GIC is the importance of integrating all of those pieces that you that you discussed and aligning them against the long term, rather than just trying to do one or the other um, on its own. Right, right. I mean, having that e whole ecosystem, right? As I said, is mm -hmm. is really key. And for each of these, I would say you do have to exercise quite a bit of thinking. Uh, as an example, when you look at performance. Uh, how do you how do you tell, right? If the short term performance is either good or not good, how do you tell you're on the right track? Uh, it requires you to really understand the process, right? So so we emphasize a lot of the the quality of process of decision making uh, because that gives us, I guess, more confidence that uh, the short term results. Uh, I guess, good or bad, right, uh, will eventually pan out as good long-term result. Um, uh, you have to kind of exercise your mind when you look at short-term result to, to think about whether it is consistent with that investment process, right? Whether it is reasonable, right? So what we strive for is uh, at least reasonable short-term result, but certainly superior long-term result. Right, so you have to for each of these area, actually you have to exercise uh, quite a bit of uh, thinking, and in fact that is where I find the learning from my peers, you know, at uh, in organizations like FCLT, uh, being really helpful, because as we try to extend our horizon, we will encounter similar challenges, and it is really good, you know, then to have all of us kind of compare notes and and come up with you know, practical right, solutions, which is another thing that I think we like to emphasize at uh, FCLT. Yes, and, and we try to be very practical. And to your point, knowing whether your uh, short-term results are aligned with the right long-term path sounds easy, but, but it's not always easy for an investor or a company. So, and sometimes that's where we see the, the conflict. Um, right. So you've talked about a, a way that you work with partners and, and your own team and so on. Can you talk a little bit about how you engage with companies that you own, investee companies? You set up front, you look for fundamental value and then try to add value over time. How do you think of the role of GIC as a as an owner of a company and in, in terms of your engagement? Right. So I guess we start with uh, who we are. Uh, who we are, are long-term uh, investor, long-term owners of our assets. Uh, now, we own many assets. So to be sure, we have to, we have to you know, prioritize right, our engagement effort. But certainly, our mindset is we like to own them for a long period of time. And in fact, 
uh, as you noted, we like to add value, you know, even during our ownership uh, period, if we can. Uh, and uh, I guess the, the, the adjective to describe uh, our engagement would be constructive, right? That we like to engage with the company uh, if we if we see that there are opportunities, you know, for them to do better, we will tell them. Uh, so our teams would meet with our investees uh, regularly. Uh, of course, if our uh, I guess our ownership stake is bigger, we will meet them more often. Uh, or if we have maybe you know special kind of expertise in certain area that we think we can be more helpful, we will meet them more often. Uh, and we give them suggestion on, you know, on how to move forward. We listen to them. We try to understand their strategy. Uh, so it is that kind of relationship. Um, and because we also uh, invest through outside managers, uh, so as part of the engagement, sometimes we would also uh, work with uh, other managers to try and understand the issues which uh, different companies face. Uh, but our objective really is to help them to, uh, to be as successful as possible. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and bringing your expertise where, where, where you have that as well as your, your influence can be really helpful. I think you've, we've at FCLT thought a lot about the, the levers of being long-term and you've already mentioned um, most of them, governance, um, incentives, engagement. Uh, uh, so that's it, that's one of the one one of the levers that that can be very important. Right. right. I mean, we have we have some you know initiatives uh, which you might say directly add to the company's uh, business. For example, we have a what we call a bridge forum, uh, which we hold every year where we bring together what people might call uh, incumbent companies, you know, companies which have been around and successful for many years uh, to meet with the startups, right? Uh, and the venture capital, which we invest in. So we try to create uh, opportunities uh, for companies to come together, right? To in a way share our network and even you know, so far, for example, that effort has been a few years. Uh, we brought together more than four hundred and fifty companies, uh, and and those are kind of you know, I guess, value add that we try to we try to give to uh, the companies and the partners which uh, we invest with. That's, so that's you're 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 both adding value directly, but also. Um, encouraging them to add value to each other through your network, which is uh, with which right, right, because it's a it's a challenging world, world out there, right? Whether it's for investors or businesses, uh, in the age of uh, disruption, uh, everyone has to kind of stay on top of, keep up with uh, new ideas, new technology, new trends. Uh, since we already have this network. Uh, we make it available uh, for our partners and investees to, you know, benefit from. Uh, and obviously, we benefit from that too, right? Learning through the process, uh, new understanding of trends, uh, and in some cases, maybe even investing opportunities. Uh, so we, we see that as something that is really worthwhile and definitely constructive. So we talk about our mission as being rebalancing capital markets to support a long-term sustainable economy. And we've talked a lot about long-term here. How do you think, um, how is GIC approaching sustainability um, in your strategy and in your investing? How are you, how are you adding that into your right. calculus these days? Right. I think long-term and, and sustainability have a huge overlap, right? In fact, they are almost interchangeable, you know, changeable. Uh, what is long-term is sustainable, right? And what is sustainable, you know, will last for a long time. So because of that, uh, we find sustainability actually quite a natural uh, match 
uh, in terms of GIC's mandate. Uh, how we have translated it you know, into our operations is to use a, very, use a very simple kind of framework, which internally we call it the ODE, you know, OD. It stands for, O stands for offense, D stands for defense, and E stands for uh, organizational excellence. Right, so let me take just a few minutes to explain. Offense is simply finding opportunities. Um, maybe in the area of sustainability, people will think about it as a like impact investing, right? That you you sort of do well and do good at the same time, uh, and you hope to create you know some really good outcome uh, in 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 sort of along the ESG uh, dimension. Uh, so we have a few efforts uh, going on in that area. Uh, defense, of course, is to make sure that uh, our portfolio holdings are you know, not uh, facing uh, difficulties uh, in terms of ESG requirement. Uh, so we actively, uh, as much as possible, help our investee companies to go through the transition. Uh, we are quite a big believer of uh, transition, uh, recognizing that uh, you, in quite a few cases, you cannot quite sort of turn from brown to green, for example, overnight. Uh, you, of course, have to put in concerted effort, but it might take a little bit of time uh, to make that uh, change. As an example, actually, two months ago, GIC invested uh, about $2 billion in uh, a utility company in the US, uh, Dew Energy Indiana, in fact. And what we found was that in that particular state, uh, the regulators uh, actually facilitate the transition from, say, a coal power uh, plant into a renewable uh, type of infrastructure. So our capital actually goes towards uh, a transition effort like that. Uh, so that uh, you know, would be a form of, I might say, I guess in that case, a mix of defensive and, and offensive you know, move. Uh, so in the defensive side, we work with, uh, I guess, to the earlier question about engagement, we work with our investee companies to, to you know, make sure that they are not on the wrong side of uh, sustainability. Uh, and then uh, the last one is uh, organizational excellence. As we manage our portfolio and engage with investees and external managers, we also have to make sure our own operations are up to scratch. Uh, so whether it is our procurement, whether it is our carbon footprint, whether it's our recycling effort internally, uh, we, we try to you know, make sure we, we live up to a, a good standard. And we are, way on, you know, we are on the way of uh, carbon neutrality by the end of this uh, fiscal year. So that's uh, an effort uh, that we also make, uh, which resonate with you know, all our people. Uh, so these three areas, uh, the you know offense, defense, and uh, organizational excellence uh, is kind of a simple way for us to move forward uh, on this important issue of sustainability. And as I mentioned, because we have a long-term mandate, we have long-term governance, we have long-term mindset, it makes it easier, right? Uh, because some of these sustain sustainability effort might take time. Uh, to see results. Uh, so thankfully, in our case, uh, our stakeholders, for example, have the patience, right? In fact, they would want to make sure that we are on that path uh, such that uh, we can not just do well, but, you know, do good uh, in the process. So it's, a great, it's a great way to keep that all in mind, the offense and defense and organizational excellence. That's, that's uh, very uh, memorable. Um, so you talked about resilience. Clearly, that has been tested in the last year um, with everything that's happened, obviously, uh, with, with the COVID-19 pandemic. 
maybe hopefully we're um, you know turning our attention uh, forward. Can you talk a little bit about as you as you look forward, what kind of long term opportunities that you you see coming out of this um, dislocation that we've had in this very very difficult year we've had over the last year it was just over a year ago that um, we had hoped to be together uh, in a at a conference which you had to not come to at the last minute and then from there everything everything sort of went went awry but as we look forward um, coming out of this time um, what are what are you what signs are you looking for right uh, yeah it it is a crisis right and <laughs> It's big, right? It's pandemic, it's global uh, indeed, and it has lasted already more than a year. Uh, it's been tough on uh, many people. Uh, and we are not yet out of the woods, uh, but I guess with the uh, vaccination, uh, there, is, there is light, right? At the end of the tunnel. And hopefully, I guess, uh, you know, people can come out, you know, safe and in, in many cases, you know, to rebuild the economy, the businesses, uh, and, and, and can move forward. As investors, uh, I guess we, we looked at this as, of course, a, a, a huge uh, disruption, right? Uh, it, it changed, uh, I think, many business models. Uh, there are some, you might say, obvious uh, trends, uh, for example, uh, digitalization just got accelerated in a big way. Uh, many people basically have been forced right on online uh, to do things. And that uh, obviously was very helpful to those businesses or business models which uh, write on digitalization for certain businesses. It's so important, right? In fact, for most businesses, it's so important uh, to go online, right? So I think we have seen quite a lot of that. Um, and that itself produces uh, opportunities. It, it creates uh, new categories of uh, services and goods uh, that a post-pandemic world will most likely uh, continue with. Uh, so the whole kind of work from home trend uh, is a big one, right? Of course, we are not... 100% sure, you know, post-pandemic where we settle, right, in terms of uh, kind of work from home practices, travels and things like that. But uh, we are quite clear that digitalization uh, will continue, right? So that's, that's one kind of big tech trend. Uh, another area, of course, is healthcare. Uh, I think pandemic was a bit of a, in a way, wake-up call. Uh, to many countries, uh, you know, of the need to invest in healthcare. And in fact, the intersection of tech and healthcare uh, has also seen, right, innovation and, and new business model. Uh, so that looks uh, quite promising uh, in terms of potential investment opportunities. Uh, sustainability, I think we talked a little bit just now, uh, again, I think the pandemic is a bit of a joke, you know, on the importance of that. Uh, the importance of being prepared, being early uh, to be on that path and not, you know, not be too late, you know, it, 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 when disaster has already struck, it's pretty hard to try and uh, cope with it or recover from it, right? So hopefully we all have learned some lesson from that. So sustainability, uh, in the last one, two years, one year in particular, I think have seen a really uh, big step forward, but a lot more needs to be done uh, and need to happen. Again, you know, technology may do some of that. Uh, I don't think itself can solve all the problem, but uh, even when you looked at uh, an area like infrastructure, right, which is, uh, which is a big area, which is quite carbon intensive. Uh, you are seeing new technology being developed, hardware and software uh, in the area of, let's say, energy, uh, which I must say look quite promising, right? So I think investor, businesses, countries, you know, need to pay attention to that. Uh, I will highlight maybe just 
to other things. Uh, China is an interesting case. Uh, they managed the pandemic well, uh, came out of it, uh, produced growth, right? When most other countries couldn't really do that last year. They also have embarked on a green economy plan. Uh, they have also got a policy or effort to develop the domestic economy, right? The so-called dual circulation. They have been quite restrained in their use of stimulus, um, which I think give them in a way more fiscal flexibility down the road. Uh, so you have quite a few significant development in that country. So for investors or businesses, uh, I think that's an important uh, area to watch as well. And finally, in talking about China, of course, uh, we have also seen, I guess, development in the geopolitical space. Um, we expect uh, more intense competition among the great powers. Uh, we believe that uh, given you know, the transition to a multipolar world, that competition is uh, a given. Um, of course, we hope uh, that it will be healthy. It can produce actually many positive things. Uh, and the interdependency among the great powers and, you know, the need for collective uh, efforts to solve big problems like climate change can sort of help to, to make sure that the competition is a healthy one, right? But as investor, of course, we have to think about uh, the risks uh, that things can turn, you know, somewhat ugly, right? Uh, as this competition across, you know, many different fields uh, is taking place uh, because the nature of geopolitical competition uh, is quite risky, right? Because uh, you, you need, you know, you need trust. Right and 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 that you know is not easy to build, and sometimes uh, the actions of a particular power uh, might be defensive action, can be viewed as offensive, right? So you can get a lot of misunderstanding as well. So we hope uh, all the leaders in charge, you know, are able to make sure that uh, they have good channels build understanding, uh, mechanism to de-escalate uh, if there is a problem, you know. So that uh, whole geopolitical area also demands uh, attention from all businesses and all investors. Uh, it's something that uh, I think is going to be with us for, for a long time, right? So... Uh, as especially for a long-term investor, uh, I think we have to get used to this uh, competition and in our own processes, uh, at least you know, build up uh, some understanding of how things are likely to evolve and have an ability to look through the lens of uh, geopolitical competition uh, when we uh, view or when we look at developments in the marketplace or in the economies. So that is also an important development, uh, maybe not quite as an area of opportunity, but certainly an important uh, trend uh, that one cannot afford uh, not to be, uh, you know, kind of monitoring. Well, as we look at risks and opportunities, the, I think you've given us a you know, both sides there, which is some very important risks um, and, and, and maybe some opportunities as well. And with the hopefully silver lining of COVID making the, the world understand that we are in interdependent and um, what, you know, whether we like it or not, when it comes to, to um, pandemics or climate or anything else, uh, it's, it's pretty hard to um, wall oneself off and be separated right. from, from the rest of the world. Um, right. And Singapore, of course, has always played such an important role in in, in trying to, um, to to encourage discussion and uh, around some of the global competitive issues. So um, right. that's important. Right. Right. 
I mean, we, I guess we have also, I mean, just speaking for GIC, we have the mindset of, you know, wanting to expand the pie, right? That uh, as a long-term investor, uh, our long-term fortune really depends on the pie growing, right? It's not so much, uh, you know, which do you get a bigger slice of that? Uh, that might be helpful in the short term, but really in the long term, it is, you know, if we can help, uh, I mean, say FCLT's effort in rebalancing the capital markets uh, or efforts like, I think we have worked together on helping to uh, make fund management mandates uh, longer term in nature. I mean, those are concrete ways we can help to expand the pies. And if we can do that, actually, I mean, certainly GIC will benefit uh, and, and, and the whole system right, will be better off. Uh, so I think it's critical, actually, uh, the work that FCLT is doing um, to you know, get us to a, a, a place that is, that is more sustainable. Well, obviously, we really appreciate that and your, your involvement and your and GIC's involvement and support of FCLT since, since the very beginning. And, and this idea of expanding the pie is, is so important. And to your point, over the long term, that is one of the, the critical things that we can do. There's, you know, there's um, uh, you know, no winners on a losing team, as you say. So I think that that is part of the idea of rebalancing these capital markets so that uh, savers and communities benefit and asset owners, asset managers and companies uh, work together. Right. Right. I think fairly early on, uh, I mean, in FCLT, we recognize that we, it takes the whole value chain, right? Uh, so thankfully, I mean, over the last few years, we have been able to get uh, many, you know, esteemed organizations in the whole value chain involved in this effort. Uh, so I'm, I'm definitely very hopeful and optimistic that, you know, we can move the needle. Well, thank you for your, for your words of wisdom, for your time today. Uh, you've given us an awful lot to think about. I think that um, GIC is often the, the model for other organizations, um, but um, like people say about you know, a Roger Federer or a great athlete, you can watch them swing the tennis racket like that, but it's pretty hard to do. So we, we, we appreciate uh, watching you uh, play like you do um, and, um, and, and trying to aspire to, to build organizations that uh, can, can do some of what you do. So thank you very much for your, for your time and your insight today. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, have this conversation. Thanks for listening to today's episode of Going Long with FCLT Global. Be sure to hit subscribe to get new episodes every other Monday. To learn more, visit our website at fcltglobal.org.